。那我们今天很高兴哈，马上就要开始我们的 keynote speech。那我们请到我们今年的大会请到两位 keynote speaker 啊，其中一位今天要给我们分享的是啊 ，Dr. Travis Oliphant。Uh, I'm going to speak in English. Travis is an experienced Python developer for scientific software, and he is the author of SciPy and NumPy, and has worked on scientific Python for more than a decade. And he has founded more than one company to help people to use Python for scientific computing. And today, Travis is going to explain us how to use Python to solve large-scale problems and by using very advanced and exciting computing technology. 呃，我再用中文再讲一次。呃 ，Travis 是一位非常非常有经验的 Python 科学软体的开发者。他开发了很有名的 SciPy 和 NumPy package。那 Travis 在 Python 的科学计算上面已经投入了十几年的时间，而且创办的不止一家公司来帮大家使用 Python 进行科学计算相关的问题。那今天 Travis 准备要告诉我们怎么样来利用 Python 解决大尺度的计算问题。那这里面会有很多很多很多先进、很有很有意思的技术。那 Please welcome Travis to the podium. Thank you very much.、Uh, it's a real honor to be here.、Uh, you have a beautiful facility, and what a great opportunity and a great place to have the first、uh, PyCon in Taiwan. I hope it's many. It's the first of many to come. Uh, Python, as, as many of you know, is、uh, a very、uh, powerful language to get your work done.、Uh, I work with a lot of people who I call domain experts. There are a lot of people out there who they, they want to do something else besides programming, and they、uh, end up using Python because it gets out of their way, and they can get to their real job, or else at least understand what their developer is trying to produce for them.、Uh, how, how many people are in the audience that this is the they're, they're new to Python? They've used Python in the past. Past year or so. So anybody who, who's just first come to Python within the past year, would you raise, raise your hand, please. Okay. How many people have used it for less than five years? Okay. And and、uh, who's used it for more than five years then? So we have a pretty healthy mix here. It looks like we have some people that are fairly new. And how, how many people have never used Python at all? This is the first time you've ever、uh, <laughs> just wandered into the wrong place. <laughs> Anybody never used Python at all? All right, so at least I'll have some common ground.、Uh, even amongst all the Python users, people use it for a lot of different things.、Uh, in at PyCon, if you go to the United States PyCon or any other Python gathering, you'll find there are, there are different camps of people. Some people are kind of web developers. Some people、uh, use it for scripting. Some people use it for all, for language processing.、Uh, other people use it for physics or for scientific computing or financial、uh, algorithmic trading. And they each kind of have their own take on why they use Python. That's one of the great things about Python is it attracts a lot of different kinds of people, people who think a little bit differently as well. I'm coming to you from the, the technical computing or scientific computing camp. That's really where I, 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 I live.、Um, my roots are in uh, uh, remote sensing, which you see here is a satellite above the Earth, kind of getting backscattered, scatter,、uh, backscattered electromagnetic radiation, and from that. Believe it or not, you can infer the wind speed and velocity by looking at the backscatter across the,、uh, from the oceans. And so, I, when I was a young graduate student in college,、uh, that's what I was studying at Brigham Young University. I was learning how to process this kind of data set and produce wind estimates from、uh, electromagnetic energy.、Uh, that was a lot of fun, and、uh, I quickly found that I really liked to be doing things at a high level. You know, I could get. It, I, I learned to program in C. I learned to program in a lot of things, and I could write C code.、Uh, but I found that if I was writing a lot of C code or C++, I'd be down there fighting with pointers, fighting with compile time errors, and kind of, and, you know, my short. You know, I'm not that smart. I don't have that much working memory, and so my working memory be all filled up with pointer arithmetic, and I'd lose track of what I was actually trying to do, which was solve a big, you know, a, a scientific problem.、Uh, when I went to a high-level language. I found that I could think more about the problem I was solving and quickly take higher-level concepts and apply those,、uh, you know, adjust them, take them in different orders, and get pictures and images、uh, of the thing I really wanted from Python. So it was really my introduction, my, my, my scientific work, that led me to use Python in the first place.、Um, I, I didn't come at it from a computer science perspective. I, I, I helped some people with their computer science homework, but often found it tedious to go through the 
uh, you know, algorithmic order complexity or looking at a compiler book or uh, trying to figure out if something's Turing complete, uh, Turing complete or not, or all, the, all these questions of computer science, they, I just didn't think about that very much. I thought about science. I thought about solving uh, array problems primarily, solving partial differential equations, solving um, large-scale problems. Like, like this one, I was in graduate school and trying to study uh, measuring, uh, we, we'd get pictures like the one on the left where you have an image of a wave. Now really, if I could show you that as a movie, it'd make more sense because we could get a movie which meant we could get that wave propagating, we could see it moving. And then from that, the goal was to figure out, well, how stiff is the material? Because very soft materials will have long wavelengths and hard materials will have short wavelengths. And if I could figure out, kind of estimate the wavelength of those images, I could uh, make pictures like on the right, where it shows uh, an elastogram or a stiffness. And ideally, try to use that to figure out how hard something was in the body. Um, so, you know, on the top is sort of this partial differential equation in Einstein's summation notation that I was trying to invert, trying to get the, the C, I, J, K, L coefficients. That's really what I was doing. It, it involved basically finding derivatives of five-dimensional data, right? I'd have these five-dimensional data and I need to take derivatives of it quickly. And, uh, you know, I could do all this in C. Nothing's stopping you from doing this in assembly, actually. I mean, you could do this in whatever language you like. But I found that if I could do it at a high level, I could keep track of what I was trying to accomplish instead of getting lost in the complexity of the, the story. And so, you know, this is really what I was, you know, this is why I, I got into Python. And, and my, uh, my background, I'm really a scientist at heart. Now, along the way, I started getting distracted <laughs> by, uh, by kind of making it easier for other scientists to do their work at a high level using Python, using open source tools. There are tools out there that help scientists do things at a high level. Uh, MATLAB, IDL, uh, PV Wave, and there's a lot of them. It's a very popular concept and it's an important concept. On the other hand, I didn't like having my code locked away into somebody's kind of mental, you know, mindset about how my code should be written. I wanted at least to have some ability to break away and try new things, add new things. With MATLAB, I didn't know exactly how it was implemented. I couldn't see the code. I didn't know exactly what it was doing. I could only trust and hope. With Python, when I found it, I realized, hey, I can know, I know this whole thing. I can look in and see the C code of Python. Now, I'm not saying I should, we should have done that, but I could learn what, how Python was written. I could see how it was organized and put together all the way down to the machine level. I could see how my operations were stacking up all the way down to the machine level and understand and reason about that and get other people who could reason about it with me. So I ended up doing a lot of work in Python, SciPy, and NumPy. Um, Python, uh, many of you know, originated from a gentleman named Guido Van Rossum. Here's a younger picture of him. I saw him a little, uh, the other, uh, little earlier this year, and he's a little bit different, a little older. Uh, still a very, very uh, you know, uh, great guy. He's from uh, uh, Netherlands. He's Dutch. It came out in 1991, actually. Python's a pretty old language. It's been around for a long time. Uh, I started using it in 96. Uh, actually, version 1.4 is actually 97, but it was version 1.4 that I started using Python, and things have changed a bit since then, but not a, not a whole terrible, not a whole lot. Uh, NumPy really, it, it was, it predated me, the origins of NumPy. Uh, there was a matrix object uh, by Jim Fulton. He, uh, he's always embarrassed when I show this slide because he doesn't think he had much to do with it, but he, he contributed to the mailing list discussion back in 1994 that really led and motivated people and encouraged Jim Huguenin to move forward with Numeric, which he, which Numeric, which he wrote in 1995. Now, we owe a lot uh, to Jim Huguenin. Uh, I was just talking to Guido uh, this, earlier this year, and he emphasized how many things came to the Python language because there was somebody like Jim and others like Paul Dubois around him and Dave, uh, David Asher, Conrad Hinson, pushing for syntax changes to Python early on to support what I'm going to call array-oriented computing or technical computing. Uh, things like complex numbers, things like multidimensional indexing on uh, array you know, notation. Uh, these things were added to the Python syntax, the Python language early on, and they had a huge impact, a huge impact. I wouldn't be here today if those had not happened because I wouldn't have chosen Python. Python would not have been uh, a language I, I got in the middle of because it wouldn't have solved my problem. So uh, I started with numeric. And then Numeray started around 2001 as, a, as an attempt to kind of grow the feature set of Numeric, but it didn't quite support all the old APIs. I was quite familiar with the Numeric code base at that point. So in 2005, I started sort of writing NumPy, which is an enhancement to Numeric, an improvement of Numeric that incorporated Numeray but kept the old APIs so that, in principle, primarily SciPy 
could be created. Because my, my, my true origins were in SciPy. I really didn't start kind of getting into the Python world thinking, hey, I'm going to go write NumPy. I'm going to go write a new array object for Python. Uh, I, like I said, I was a scientist. I wanted to solve problems in Python at a high level. And I realized, well, I also want to be able to, there weren't routines that were available. It wasn't easy to integrate. There weren't special functions. There weren't uh, part, uh, ordinary differential equation solvers. But I noticed that these, a lot of these were available as 4chan libraries, as C libraries, out on the net in, a, in the public domain. And so I started this project in 1999 to wrap them, in, kind of by hand mostly. And uh, fortunately, people came along and started to help with things like F to Pi. But in 1999, was a, well, I was, should have been doing my dis dissertation probably. <laughs> I sort of spent a year longer on my dissertation than I probably needed to in order to write SciPy and the origins of, of SciPy. Now, those packages didn't become SciPy until 2001 when I joined them together with uh, Eric Jones and Piara Peterson, who, who added a few modules themselves into this Uber package called SciPy. And then SciPy kind of grew as a community. And, it, and now SciPy is more than a library. It's sort of this large community of people uh, adding SciKits image, SciKits learn. There's lots of uh, objects that build on top of arrays. Uh, so NumPy and SciPy, uh, sort of in SciPy, using SciPy, I got involved with NumPy in order to create that array object. Did a lot of work to pull, put, put NumPy out there. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was sort of some tedious work to try to merge several divergent camps. And it took about six months uh, to get the first version out and then about a, a year of debugging, I would say, uh, over, you know, iterative debugging. It's, I mean, it's, it's eight years of debugging. I mean, we're still debugging, right? There's still issues that you, you, you fix. And fortunately, there's a large community of people, not as large as it could be. Uh, I would say that, you know, it's, it's, are, there aren't that many people who know enough about, I guess, the concepts of ray-oriented computing and, and writing in C to, ha to help, perhaps. Uh, but it definitely could use more people. So if there are other people here who are interested in getting involved, there's plenty of room to get involved and help and contribute to the projects. And they're definitely community efforts. So why Python for technical computing? Why, why do I care about Python? Why do I like Python? Why use it? Well, one is the syntax gets out of your way. There's a great saying that says, uh, you know, Robert Kern, who's a contributor to the NumPy and SciPy communities, has said, you know, when asked why Python, says, it gets out of my way. Other people say it fits your brain. Now, you know, thinking about that, I, one of my interests is actually neuroscience. Uh, well, what do you mean fits your brain? How does that work? It's, I think it's basically leveraging language sensors you can, it's executable English. Now, I've always wondered, and now I'm here in a, in, in a community, in an audience of primarily Mandarin or Chinese-speaking people, I actually don't know if Python gets in your way or not. <laughs> and I could see that it doesn't really perhaps leverage Chinese script. And, and so, uh, but I guess if you've learned English, then it can leverage those, con those, those parts of your brain that have learned English. Uh, I often wonder, I mean, what would a language built by uh, you know, Chinese look like? How would it work, and how would it not get in their way? Uh, you know, there's who knows that's that's yet to be uh, that's that's yet to be uh, figured out. Uh, but it is important to get out of the way of a programmer. You're trying to get ideas into the computer without having the language kind of get in your way, you know, and that's 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 a difficult thing to get right. Um, overloadable op operators are huge. The fact that you can create a new object like NumPy and have plus and equal and plus and plus equals and uh, operations work as they should. Instead of making method calls everywhere, that's a big deal. Complex numbers support early on is a big deal. Java made the mistake of not including them. Bad mistake. Uh, Java is not useful for scientific computing because they don't have complex numbers, in my mind. Other things as well, but uh, C also made that mistake. C++ made that mistake. Complex numbers are critical, uh, and we'll maybe see a couple examples of why. Just enough language support for arrays. I think I could use a little more. I, I would like to see a couple more things added to the language, particularly a, a, an array operator. Uh, but it's just enough support. And then occasional programmers can grok it. That fits kind of in with the syntax, not getting in your way. By occasional programmers, I mean those domain experts, people that have other things to do with their life, like you know, solving partial differential equations or uh, looking for genomes or you know, uh, trying to make trades in the financial market. People who have these concepts in their head, but they, they do need computers. They need to understand what the computers are doing. They can't just say, okay, well, you make the computer work for me. There's so much lost in translation between someone who, okay, I'm gonna make this computer work versus what do you want it to do? That you really need a language that could communicate across on, and Python helps. Uh, it supports multiple programming styles. That's a huge deal. It doesn't force you to do objects if you don't want to. You can just do procedures. You can make procedures on top of the objects that already exist. 
but you can build new objects. It also supports very sophisticated metaprogramming concepts. You can make meta-classes, you can make, uh, do all kinds of interesting things at a higher level with Python. Uh, that leads to expert programmers being able to use Python effectively to actually do quite a bit. And part of that also is the way it's implemented. Because Python is a simple, extensible implementation, a lot of people have been able to get in and do different things to it, to kind of move it in different directions. That's a big deal. And then it's a general purpose language, so you can build a system. One of the complaints people have of R, or MATLAB, which is also used in similar environments that Python is used, is they start using R to do their problems, and they realize, I can't build a system out of this, it doesn't work. I can build a prototype, I can do analysis, but then if I want to make a system, I gotta throw it over the fence to my developers who build it in C++. Whereas in Python, you literally can, your prototype, and that same code can be you know, cleaned up a little bit, maybe made a little more robust for input errors and that sort of thing, and then it can be part of your system and your production live system. And then finally, which is not to be underestimated, uh, Python does have critical mass. I mean, you could, I could imagine a different language that had you know, even better features than Python does. But it is, it is important, and it's kind of a nonlinear dynamical system as to whether it'll get critical mass or not. But it does need critical mass because we need each other, we need to share the work of each other. Not, we're sort of, none of us are, are, have enough time to do everything. And it helps to be able to collaborate and share our work. Now, Python is not perfect. Um, I love Python, I'm a user of Python for a long time. There are things that are wrong with it. Opportunities for improvement, I might call them. Uh, opportunities for you to get involved and maybe make a difference. Uh, packaging is still not solved wet yet, especially for the folks in the SciPy world, in the technical computing world. Uh, distribute PIP and disuse TILS too, which are the new ones, they don't cut it, unfortunately. Uh, so trying to make, do some work on that to see if we can, we can improve the situation. Uh, missing anonymous blocks, kind of having the ability to take a section of code that includes, a, 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 includes statements as well as expressions and pass that around almost like an AST passing around as a, as a function call. It, 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 it turns out there's some very useful and important concepts that, allow, that allows. And then the C Python runtime I think is aged. I think it's old. I think it needs a kind of a, a, a renewal. Uh, it, still has, it has, still has a gill. Uh, it's global interpreter lock. Global variables are everywhere inside of it. And uh, it doesn't have dynamic compilation support, which it could get. Uh, and then uh, no, no, there's no approach to language extensions except for import hooks. By this I mean little easy ways to build uh, DSLs or, or um, what does that stand for? <laughs> Domain specific languages uh, quickly on top. Uh, you know, and we're talking with Guido about this concept earlier this year, not necessarily something that would support the, you know, full macros and, and the full list concepts, but just something to make it a little bit easier except using just, just DSLs. Uh, the next point might be a little controversial, but I think it's actually a distraction to have multiple runtimes. Uh, for all the benefits of Iron Python and PyPy and Jython, they actually take a lot of developer attention as opposed to just making the C Python runtime better. Uh, anything you want to do to connect with Java, you can do through the C Python runtime. Uh, anything you want to do to connect to .NET, you can do through the C Python runtime as well. Uh, and any kind of machine code you want to produce, you can do, through, do from the C Python as, as well. That's a very controversial position. It just happens to be my position, uh, especially in the scientific community where those other those other efforts have really been more of a distraction to us than really a benefit. Um, and then kind of part and parcel with that is the fact that the general Python devs don't really always understand the array-oriented and uh, uses of NumPy and why people use NumPy, what, it, what its point is. They, they understand it somewhat, but it's sort of not really, um, there are a lot of Python developers, there are not enough Python developers who are also kind of scientific developers. It turns out it's sort of difficult to do both. Um, hoping we can keep that, keep that happening. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we're trying to do with using Python for scientific computing is to put, put the science back in computer science. Uh, a lot of the software stack you're familiar with, C++, Java, Visual Basic, .NET, Objective-C, sort of what forgets about complex numbers, forgets about vectorization primitives, sort of things. You don't need those things, you can just put them on top. Well, you can, but then people do it differently in different ways, and then there aren't, isn't effective compiler support for this, uh, this, these very important technologies for domain, domain users and, and end users. Uh, so array-oriented programming, which is an early use case, something we'll talk about here, uh, has been supplanted you know, by object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is useful, but array-oriented programming needs to be understood as well because it's a very, very important uh, design pattern and concept. And what that leads to is a software stack for scientists is not as helpful as it could be, especially when it comes to large-scale distributed computing. 
Uh, so Fortran is still where a lot of users end up. A lot of high performance computing, a lot of scientific scientists out there use Fortran and message passing, MPI. And that's, and there's nothing, and, and despite all the billions of dollars in software development spent everywhere else, they're still just going and doing that. And there's some positive things about that, but also some negative things about that. It sort of keeps things difficult. So I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by array-oriented computing and just give some perspective. Uh, it's sort of a, it's, I agree it's a kind of a nebulous term, nebulous concept, but hopefully it'll get you uh, a little more understanding of what I'm, I'm talking about. So let's take a, the, a simple example of generating Fibonacci numbers. Right, so Fibonacci numbers support this uh, recursive equation. The nth number is the sum of the previous two. And then the, the, the first number is zero and one. And you get this sequence from a simple application of that. All right, so how would you do this in Python? Common approaches, you might on the left say, well, I'll do a recursive solution because that's cool and I can talk about Python supports recursion. And uh, you, know, you might do something like that. And then the second Fibonacci definition, that function returns a list of those, a list of, tw of n of those, capital N of those. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you might look at the algorithmic compl complexity and realize, well, that's not going to be very good to do this recursive solution twice. That'll uh, grow exponentially uh, as the time to create that many Fibonacci uh, numbers shows. So a little an iterative approach. So the iterative approach gets closer to what I might, might mean by array-oriented computing, but you're still explicitly constructing this list and iterating over terms in the list to build element by element, basically. You're intentionally writing code to do every piece of that. All right, so what is, what's an array-oriented approach? Well, an array-oriented approach would be, there's a couple ones I can think of. One is just using NumPy. I'll compute the roots of the recursive relationship that uh, that represents, take those roots and form a general solution, and then evaluate that general solution on a vector of integers, right? So let's look at the Fibonacci 2a example. Fibonacci 2a, a range produces a list of integers from 0 to n. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and they're all floats in this case. And then it takes that list, and then the r1 raised to the power of n, that gives you n elements back, where that r1 has been raised to that power for every element in that list. Right, so as a programmer, I can write that one line, and I get the loop implied. So it's a, it's a vectorized uh, loop. Then subtracting the uh, power of uh, the R2 raised to the same power, and then multiplying that by a constant, I generate the Fibonacci numbers, Fibonacci sequence. That's, that's, that's probably an easy way to think of a vectorized solution to Fibonacci. Um, the SciPy approach is to use linear filters and recognize that Fibonacci sequences are a, basically an uh, unstable recursive filter. And in SciPy, there's ability that I can create a uh, polynomial or a simple linear filter with a numerator and a denominator that, that is in the uh, B and A coefficients, respectively. And then have my input be zeros. And just with initial conditions of 0 and 1, I produce this output from linear filter. Right? So without any looping sort of at the higher level, without me thinking about looping, I think about I'm solving this problem that is a linear filter. And so I'll, make, I'll just make one. Okay, so that, that's an array-oriented approach. And if you look at kind of the time to create n Fibonacci copy numbers, there's a couple advantages of this approach. One, if you understand anything about linear systems or anything about uh, you know, vec uh, vectors, uh, that makes good sense. I mean, if you don't, then you might kind of be curious as to what all that means and how it works. Once you understand those concepts, it makes perfect sense. And it's easy to reason about, easy to look at, easy to modify. There's fewer lines of code. But it also runs faster. Uh, so this is just the time to create n Fibonacci numbers. Now before, you notice I only went to 20 because of the exponential comparison of the recursive relationship. That just, you can't get 200 uh, very quickly, Fibonacci sequence very quickly with the recursive solution. Now with the iterative solution, you do okay, it keeps up, but you can still do faster with the NumPy solution of the formula, it grows, and then uh, the linear filter, the SciPy approach kind of has constant time behavior at least through that number of, uh, number of times. Now, in this particular case, you're not producing that many Fibonacci sequences. Maybe you're not too concerned. But it gives you an idea of kind of how an array-oriented approach to that problem would look and what NumPy is really all about and trying to provide to the end user and to the domain expert. Okay, so NumPy, some of you may not be familiar with NumPy. Uh, show of hands, how many people have used NumPy? Real way up high so I can see. So not very many. That's, that's not too surprising. A lot of people using Python don't. They don't really understand why they would care about an array. 
if they're not doing math. But it turns out you, you can use arrays all the time if you're not using math. They, they're a, a data structure that can be useful for all kinds of algorithms. So NumPy, just to give you a brief overview, it basically has two things in it. One is this array object that is a, really a wrapper around bytes. It's an interpretation of raw bytes in the machine. And that interpretation is applied by this data type concept. And the data type concept is, goes beyond just simple floats, ints. It can be structures of floats and ints. It can be uh, big Indian or little Indian floats and ints. There's some, it's important, that it, it's more than just an array of floats. Uh, so you can, and you can slice it, you can dice it, you can grab pieces out of it, you can in, uh, interact with it in a multidimensional way. And then nobody would care about that data structure unless you could do fast math on it. And that's the other piece that NumPy provides is, are these universal functions as well as some uh, fa other fast math. Things, and you can do uh, linear algebra, you can do random number generation, you can do Fourier transforms uh, on these arrays of objects. And then with the SciPy stack, and the rest of the modules around it, which all use that same data structure, you can do all kinds of things. You can do machine learning, you can do image processing, you can do uh, you know, anything you can think of uh, doing with MATLAB or IDL or, or any set of Fortran libraries, you can do with Python using uh, NumPy and probably some, and some extension. So NumPy itself basically is a wrapper around memory or around bytes. So uh, this shows kind of that linear ordering of bytes that might exist in uh, a modern machine. And then with the shape, that information understands those bytes as a, an array. 2D, 3D, 4D, could be n-dimensional array. And then the data type information, that describes how to interpret bytes in the NumPy array. How do I understand that? Uh, it, it's really dynamic typing, dynamic data typing on those bytes. And uh, that really is the uh, a NumPy array. Uh, the Zen of NumPy, uh, many people know the Zen of Python if you import this. Uh, this is what I consider to be the Zen of NumPy. Uh, strided is better than scattered. We'll see examples of that before. It's better to have your data kind of localized and just scattered all over the place. It's better for machines. Uh, contiguous is better than strided. It's better to have your data close instead of having to jump in memory very far. Uh, descriptive is better than imperative. Being able to just say this is what I mean is easier to manage than having a whole bunch of code just to talk about what you just could say. That's the whole, one of the purposes of languages in the first place, computer languages. Um, Array-oriented is better than object-oriented. Now, it might, you know, not, that's probably not universally true, but for the purpose of this Zen, it's, it's appropriate. Uh, broadcasting is a great idea. And uh, vectorized is better than an explicit loop. Unless it's too complicated, then use something like Cython or Numba, as we'll see later. And then think in higher dimensions. So um, just a little quick demo to, for people who aren't familiar with NumPy very well. And how, what, what, how, what's the time? How much time should I use for this talk? Uh, so let's see. 25 minutes more, right? Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to make a simple array. Let's clear the figure. Uh, Lin space from minus 10 to 10, a thousand elements, right? So X now has a shape. It's a thousand, it's a 1D array of length, thousand. I could reshape this. I could assign the shape and make it a 20 by 50 if I wanted to. And now I have a 20 by 50 array. If I wanted to look at the elements of that, you know, usually with images with large scale data, you can't just print the values. You have to look at it with a plot or with an image or some other way. Um, of course, this isn't that interesting. It's a reshaped scan from negative 10 to 10, and so it's going to look pretty bland. Uh, but you might be thinking, oh, I could figure out ways to make gradients with this. And yes, you can. You can do all kinds of image processing with uh, NumPy arrays very easily and very quickly. Uh, I once made a little calendar, or a little calendar with a you know alpha in image ability, uh, just using NumPy. Uh, it's it's pretty simple to do all kinds of interesting things once you know how to manipulate arrays. Well, let's put the shape back to where we had it before. And now, usually what somebody does with this one-dimensional array of, of floats from minus 10 to 10 is do some function on it. So um, I might import the sync function and compute the sync function. And then if I clear the figure, I can plot that function. And I can see, you know, there's my sync function. Plot just puts the dots and then draws a line between them. Now I might want to do something like, I want to plot all the elements that are bigger than zero. I want to annotate those. 
with a red circle. Right? And you can see just those parts have been annotated with a red circle. And I can see and you know, interact with my data that way. Uh, again, all this is array-oriented computing. I'm sort of thinking of my data as a block, as a chunk, and I'm then operating on it as a block and a chunk, getting results as a block and a chunk, and then doing something with it as a block and a chunk. And uh, what, what's, what's lack, I mean, and this is sort of all done by, you know, a, a bunch of amateurs, really, in computer science, people that, you know, don't necessarily know how to optimize this in the greatest way possible. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward, and it's very, and it's very, very powerful. People, domain experts love this. They love to be able to do this with their data. They love to be able to interact with their data like this. Quickly, uh, you saw that grid I had in the NumPy example that was 100 by 100. It's a very large grid and updated real time. It was very quick to, do, to work. If I played this one, it works fine. It's actually a nice interface. I kind of like uh, what they've done here. Let's put a random grid up there and then do it continuously. And it's speedy. It works, it works fine. If I grew this to a larger set of points, I think it would be you know, more difficult. So there's a sort of non-array-oriented version of life and an array-oriented version of life to try to maybe help clarify a little bit what, what I mean by array-oriented. Um, one last point about array-oriented. Very often, you'll see uh, large-scale systems today built out of many little objects. And sometimes, object-oriented approaches lead you to scatter your data all over the place. Because you'll have like a list of objects. And on a modern machine, that list of objects might be everywhere. And uh, kind of, you're constantly sort of jumping around in memory to try to pull this in. Now, you know, a lot of people have done work on caches and tried to overcome this with the cache uh, behavior. But you can usually get a lot better, a lot faster, a lot more performance if you just collect your data together and use kind of the flyweight pattern to pull out objects, but the data itself is all organized together. NumPy lets you do this. NumPy lets you sort of organize all your data together, kind of all your data of an object together in one row of a table, and then if you want an actual object out, you can pull it out, manipulate it, do whatever you want with it, but the data itself is all stored together. And then you can do other interesting things like column-wise operations down the attributes which would be you know, rather difficult to do here. Here you can do it with one line, uh, very simply, if you organize your data like this. So array-oriented approaches, are, the benefits are that many technical problems are naturally array-oriented, and they're easy to vectorize and express that way. Uh, algorithms can be expressed at a very high level, and then they can be usually parallelized more easily, especially today where modern machines are really getting um, sort of these there are really these pipeline tool instruments. They've got all these processors, and the processor growing, but the bandwidth of the data bus is not growing. It really promotes, uh, if you have your algorithms written in a vector or array-oriented way, uh, you're going to be able to make them faster on a modern machine. Um, so it maps well to modern hardware caches and, and pipelines, as well as a mapping well to uh, parallelization, because you can pretty much tell uh, what parts need to be parallelized and which parts don't. It's, it's much more easy to do that. But I would say that we need more focus on compiled, array-oriented languages with fast compilers. We don't really have that. Kind of NumPy gets around that by sort of pre-baking in a lot of compiled loops and then dynamically selecting those loops at runtime. But there's a lot of things that, where that, that approach gets a little sticky and doesn't work as well as it could uh, with an actual array-oriented language and fast compilers. Uh, so, some of that, I think, is going to be come down the pipe. I'm, I'm kind of excited about what, what we're working on, what other people are working on in this space. Uh, so what is good about NumPy? Summarize kind of the things we've talked about, array-oriented. It's got an extensive data typing system, including structures. I haven't gone into that in depth, but uh, there's more to say there. It's got a C API, so you can actually call it and ex extend it itself. It's uh, fairly straightforward to understand. It's not too complicated uh, currently. You can do memory mapping, which means you can support enormous you can have a big disk problem. You can have terabytes of, of data that doesn't fit all in the memory, and yet kind of reason about it very simply with a NumPy expression, and then process those pieces, perhaps in different threads. Uh, it's got a large community of users, and it's really easy to interface C, C++, and Fortran code to, to NumPy. And there's a lot wrong with NumPy, too. Uh, the D-type system is difficult to extend. It's not, uh, uh, it's the immediate mode of creating huge temporaries is not a good idea most of the time. Every time you do a computation in NumPy, it creates a, a value. So in that APL example, I saw, you, we saw, I showed you know, lots of little updates, a grid plus, and then that was added to another grid, and that was added to another grid. Well, every one of those operations creates a temporary, and then, that creates an, and then that's added to the other. And so this immediate mode behavior, you can end up consuming a lot of, of uh, memory in order to vectorize your problem. 
I think we can do better than that. That's not necessary, intrinsically. Um, it's sort of almost an in-memory in database. You can do query-like behaviors, uh, SQL database-like behaviors on the data stored in NumPy, and it's actually very, very fast. Using NumPy compared to SQLite, usually 10 times faster uh, for very simple operations. Uh, mostly it's because of the data structures that are chosen and the way uh, you, you, the person usually organizes their data. Uh, so you're benefiting from the, from the developer as opposed to having the database try to interpret what the developer intended and do an okay job most of the time. Uh, it doesn't integrate with sparse arrays. It, there are sparse arrays in SciPy, but they don't, uh, they're not sort of part of everything. The code base is, is organic. It's hard, a little hard to extend. It's grown from Jim Huguenin's codes in there. I've got code in there. So there's a number of people who have contributed to the code base, and it's, uh, it's pretty big. And there's minimal support for uh, multi-core GPU uh, codes. So there's a lot of improvements that are needed. You can go down this list, but it's kind of boring to go down a long list like this. You can look at it, read it. Uh, you can know that I've sort of been thinking about this long list of things for about uh, a year now. There's a ton of things that, that NumPy needs to improve. And I think to take it where it needs to be to support what domain experts are actually trying to do with their data, with their problems, especially in an environment with lots of machines that are available, but not lots of bandwidth is available. Uh, and so how do we do this? How do we sort of grow NumPy into the place it needs to be, including uh, D-type improvements? Um, I'll say a little bit about this, because in the end of the day, a, a D-type is a dynamic data type. And its, its purpose is to basically help the runtime select machine instructions for the bytes that are available. So uh, if you, I've had the chance to play with a compiler, and if you, look, if you think about what a compiler does, most of the time it's taking your typed object and then trying to pick which machine instructions to apply to the, those bytes in order to get the functions you want. So it might take a, oh, I have to do a floating point add here, uh, or an integer add here, or I've got to take two floating points and add them together because you've got a complex number here. You've got to take, take a different machine instructions. So, Dynamic data typing is really about doing that at runtime, like taking bytes that are available, and then at dynamic at runtime, selecting, saying, oh, you've applied this, you've, you've interpreted these bytes as this particular kind of data, I'll be able to dispatch to the machine instructions that can work, uh, or, or build them on the fly as well, and then jump to them to work. Um, so data types really at the key of that interpretation. And the goal is to support all kinds of data, all kinds of data, so that you can basically map Every data you have, an image, a movie, a, a, a text file, whatever it is, a CSV, whatever it is, map that directly through a D-type to a, an array that you can compute on. So that mapping can be separated from the computation. There's a lot of benefits from that. Um, we won't have time to go into that today to show kind of the power that that will bring to a domain expert trying to do data analysis. Uh, but you can imagine a simple object-defined data type where I've mapped a symbol, an open, close, high, low, to actual data that's stored somewhere or that is part of a, a stream of bytes. And then I might have a piece of that data, like mid here, that's computed on the fly. It's not actually stored anywhere, but I can access it if it were and just on the fly generate the data that I need. Sometimes, in, in some databases, that's called a computed column, uh, but it's a straightforward addition to an extension to what, what NumPy is about. Lots of improvements on the UFUNC side and more improvements are needed. So to accomplish this, we basically started a new project. Uh, and, and we're basically going to be migrating NumPy to something called Blaze. Uh, basically, num NumPy and Pi tables, which is a sort of an interface, a disk persistent interface to NumPy, if you merge those together, you can start to think about and getting, get something called Blaze. It's basically a next generation NumPy. It's my vision of a next generation NumPy. It's out of core. It's, it has distributed tables. Won't have time to go into great detail about this, but it's, and it'll take roughly a year to a year and a half to emerge and uh, be available. Uh, but you'll start seeing pieces of it here in the next six months to nine months. Uh, it's basically, there'll be a new ND array with multiple memory segments, not just one. A and then on top of that, a distributed ND table, which can span, basically span the world. Like you can have an ND table that refers to elements, data elements that are, that are anywhere, uh, located anywhere. And then fast out of core algorithms for all those functions. Uh, delayed mode execution built in so that you can have, uh, and there's some details there that are a little difficult. Delayed mode execution can be difficult to debug, and so you want to be able to control that and, not have to, not have, and be able to have good tools for, okay, now I want to make this inter, uh, immediate. Uh, but in, in, in production, I want this delayed. 
uh, built-in indexes, built-in labels, and then sparse dimensions defined by attributes. And then the, 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 the big one is this direct adapters, adapters to all kinds of data. Uh, in NumPy, there is this ability to basically map to di di data on disk using the memory map facility of most, uh, most operating systems. What that meant is that using the same virtual memory concepts that operating systems use to page data that's on disk into memory and then operate on it, by applying a simple adapter, easy to spell in Python, you can create this object that is reading from this large disk and have it be in an umpire array and do operations as if it's sitting on disk. Basically extending that concept to all kinds of data. Uh, imagine being able to take a list of images and have it treated in Python as a three-dimensional array. Or you can write operations that, because of delayed mode execution, won't actually read the data you care about until runtime. But the, and the data adapter manages the translation between the image and the data that needs, uh, and the way it needs to be computed with in, in Python. Uh, the same for, uh, for uh, movies, the same for, uh, but most of the time, and where we'll optimize first is for simple text files, text CSV files. But the same concept applies to many other uh, concepts. So, you know, delayed execution might look like this. You can build a tile of multiple arrays, and then as a single array, do some operations. This is basically a simple filtering operation on that tile, that list. And then from that filtered list, do a sum. That creates essentially an execution graph that then you can execute. Uh, sync local is just an imagined way to say perhaps, okay, actually, now actually build this instead of just have this uh, possibility of, 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 of computation. The ability to define dimensions by attributes is really kind of this concept of group by that comes from da databases, where if I have a table, day, month, and year are certain columns in the table, what if I want to now think of this high and low set of tables I want to think of those that day, month, year instead of as attributes. I want to think of those dimensions. I want to sum along the day dimension. And I want to therefore group by everything in the same day and do a, do a reduction. So the system basically will have ND table, ND array, a generic function, a data type, bytes, domain. These are basically objects that the system will, 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 will contain. An ND table you, will be a partition of a large, you know, distributed array concept, basically, where pieces can live on multiple processors, uh, multiple parts of the array. Each partition can be a remote table, it can be an expression, or it can be a local ND array. Uh, and then these remote pieces can have a data URL. This is, if, if, we can, if we're successful with this one, this is probably one of the, the most out there concepts but uh, I'm, ex I'm most excited by it, actually, because it, it basically creates a global addressing for data, array-like data, uh, that you can take your data and make it participate in this global addressing space. Very much like the web allows documents to be chained together in, via URLs. Uh, there's, there, there's a tool called OpenDAP that kind of gets to this a little bit, but uh, this is really, but once you apply the data typing concept, the the world's data becomes available as variables in your script. And then you can do operations on that. And then the most important piece is that instead of pulling data to your machine in order to operate on it, you, do, you invert that and you shed, send code to the data where it, where it sits. So by describing the problem you're trying to do, the scheduler can invert what's typically done today, which is mostly moving data around, taking data from here to there, moving it to here so a local script can work on it. But uh, if we're successful in creating this concept of a data URL, um, then you'll be able to build a scheduler which pushes the code to the data. So that concept, the main script, code gets pushed to the processing nodes. What is the code? Um, we'll skip here a little bit so I can talk a little bit about kind of how does this code look. Uh, ND array is just an improved version of NumPy so that it can handle all, all the generalities that are needed. And then general functions are an improved version of the NumPy U function, U funks, so that all functions can go through the same concept, the same object concept. Um, timeline, this is an aggressive timeline, but we hope to have basically an early beta release by the end of the year, and then uh, a version one by next June. Uh, we're working on it with about, you know, uh, four or five developers right now. Um, so we're hoping to be able to get something in place uh, fairly soon. And then PyData, is going to be a growing collection of web pages, essentially the same as SciPy works with NumPy. PyData will be SciPy-like packages that work with Blaze. Uh, so that'll take a while to emerge. And uh, one important piece is how do you send code to the data? It's important that that code be 
high level, express at a high level, but not pay a performance penalty when it goes to the machine to process on. And so one piece of the puzzle that's sort of missing in the Python space is ability to write simple Python expressions and have machine code created. Now that, that puzzle piece is actually available in lots of different ways. There's things like Cython, there's things like Shedskin, there's things like uh, PyPy, which uh, PyPy has a nice technology, but it doesn't integrate well with the rest of the ecosystem, so it's difficult to figure out how to use it, frankly. Um, hopefully maybe we'll be able to, re maybe uh, the community will be able to grow and there'll be a lot of interaction. Um, but the goal of Numba is to dynamically compile Python code to a function pointer. And it takes advantage of the LLVM tool stack to do that. Once you have this, you have a lot of benefits. You can take things like, um, the reason you get a lot of benefits is because the, the, there are so many hardware vendors that are taking backends and writing the backends for you. LLVM is this intermediate representation between the front end that translates your syntax and the back end that goes to machine code. And basically, by using LLVM, we're allowing the hardware vendors, like AMD, NVIDIA, Intel, to write the back ends that produce fast machine code, and we just write the front end. It's a really cool project. And it's not difficult, basically, with the, with the extensions to, to Python, to take a function like this, the sync function, with an if statement and a return and then another calculation, and convert that to an intermediate code representation, which if, looks something like that. It's kind of a mini assembly language. And then that can, be, that can be shipped over a wire, it can be sent anywhere you want, it can be dynamically compiled and produce machine code on the fly that executes at native speeds. So once you have something like that, uh, coupled with Python, you have a pretty good stack for defining all kinds of calculations, especially with the existence of tools like CLang that can also take Fortran, Objective-C, C, and C++ code, and also produce LLVM that can be committed to it. Now, I've just sort of described, and very briefly, and I can go into more detail about it if we had two hours, three hours, maybe more, uh, kind of a program that I think is, is, could significantly change the way domain experts write code. It's gonna take some resources to do it. So I've, we have a dual strategy. Basically, we've got a nonprofit organization called NumFocus, uh, and that's gonna be focused on the open source and really trying to promote Blaze as an open source project, which uh, I believe it needs to be. And then Continuum Analytics is a, is a for-profit company, we've created to do consulting from the big data organizations. Everybody's interested in big data. We think we've got a solution to big data. We can try to um, you know, pitch that to the large organizations. So NumFocus, I'm gonna mainly talk about NumFocus because it's the open source thing. Go to the web page and learn more. And I think I'll just uh, uh, sort of end there. The web page, NumFocus at web page, sort of, it's an umbrella organization trying to promote, its mission is to promote uh, education on array-oriented programming and using Python for technical computing to support Py uh, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, IPython, and the host, Sim SimPy, and the host of other scientific uh, packages on Python, and then encourage reproducible scientific research using these tools as well. Um, it's formed basically of people that have been part of Matplotlib, IPython, SciPy, and NumPy, and we're trying to you know, grow that, and uh, you can get involved if you'd like. It's, a, it's an open source uh, foundation. And then, uh, I appreciate the time coming here. It's been good to visit with everybody. Uh, I am at Continuum, that's the company I'm at, and when I get a spare moment, I like to do open source stuff, <laughs> but uh, I have to pay the bills somehow, and Continuum is the way we do that. And we, uh, we do Python training, large-scale data analysis, consulting on NumPy and NumPy support, as well as Blaze and PyData development. So and there'll be more you'll hear from us on the commercial side over the next year, year and a half. It's been great uh, to be here. I don't know if you have time for any questions. Uh, I, I, I know I can talk for like two hours, so it's just, <laughs> I'm used to training all day, so. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Okay, let us thank Travis for his great talk. Thank you. And please use this speaker. When it's, the light is on, you can speak like me. So <coughs> just raise your hand and uh, have your question here. Yes, please. Uh, Travis, I, I like NumPy and the SciPy, but uh, you couldn't you ask, do you uh, use that? I use that, yeah, so I write him right now. And the second, uh, talking about uh, bioinformation uh, technology, I also read a book uh, 
and this uh, is very useful to use like uh, uh, NumPy and SciPy. So do you have any uh, idea or experience to share us? So the question is, can you use NumPy for bioinformatics? Uh, right now, already have some um, uh, programmer use uh, NumPy and SciPy, but sure. uh, uh, how about you, you look at the trend? Yeah. I, well, I've seen, I mean, I don't, I'm not aware of every trend. Every, 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 I, I've been at conferences, NIH conferences, National Institutes of Health in the United States, where people are using uh, Python for information processing. And typically in bioinformatics, you go from a text file to tabular form. And the text file processing currently might not use NumPy much, although we're looking to change that. Uh, I think there's some things they can do differently. Um, but once they get to tabular form, people are using NumPy all the time to do all kinds of basically record, uh, different you know, column-oriented processing on those uh, relationship data, you know, sequence uh, information between how a, a piece of a part of a sequence is in multiple parts of the genome. Um, all kinds of, uh, I forget the acronyms, I'm not in bioinformatics myself, but yeah, it's used all the time and it's, it's growing. A lot of people started with Perl because of its string processing, mm -hmm. but the advantage of Python is it does string processing, but also you can do science once you get the results of that string process, parsing. So people like to, if they can stay in the same language, it's sometimes easier. So yeah, use is growing, definitely. Thank you. Uh, last year, I began to use Python, and this year, I began to use JavaScript. And I, it seems that uh, I, uh, they are some similar to each other. Yeah. And uh, can you do some uh, comments about these two languages, Python and, uh, and uh, JavaScript? JavaScript? Yes. Comparison between Python and JavaScript. Well, I'm not the best person to comment on that, although at Continuum, we do web interfaces, uh, user interfaces. I have a lot of appreciation for JavaScript. They, they benefit from each other, right? You've seen JavaScript grow because of, you know, kind of add to its language features that Python has and vice versa. Uh, JavaScript is very similar. It's a, very, it's a dynamic language. You can create objects on the fly. It's sort of a little less structured in terms of objects. You can sort of make an object by just a dictionary of methods, dictionary of uh, kind of building a mapping or a dictionary of attributes and functions. You have an object in JavaScript. The big advantage of JavaScript is that it's currently the language inside of a bunch of browsers. So if you want to do client-side programming in a browser, you use JavaScript. Uh, now other people can do client-side programming in an application using Python and then maybe WebKit to display HTML at the same time. But uh, presently JavaScript has a lot of momentum because it's used in the browser. On the server side, I don't, there's sort of, I don't know a real benefit to using JavaScript versus Python. Uh, I've seen people do both. It's uh, kind of depend, it becomes a religious war at that point. Kind of people like what they're familiar with. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to learn new things, right? So once you learn something new, you want to kind of stick with it. You don't want to have somebody else. And there's also, there, there's stakes involved, right? Because you could have the perfect language in the world, and if nobody else uses it, you're not going to be as, uh, it's not going to be as good for you, right? Critical mass is an important thing. But the world is benefited by having uh, JavaScript and Python together. Yeah, I think we can allow one or two questions. If you have, you can raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, I know there is a project which is called Kleiser or Kleiser. It translates Python code into OpenCL. Do you, uh, how do you compare the approach, uh, the approach of open, uh, the Kaiser and the number? It's called Kaiser? Uh, C-L-Y-T-H-E-R, I guess, I think. Slither? Slither. Slither, oh, Slither. Slither. yeah. Uh, Slither translates Python code into C code, and then links against the OpenCL. So Slither is very similar to Cython, really. Um, in the same category, uh, it focuses on, there's a couple differences. Uh, Numba focuses on building dynamic runtime, right, rather than a shared loss, shared object that is used, that uses DL open to load into the main running Python. Uh, Numba, because it builds on the LLVM tool stack, can load something dynamically without creating a shared extension on disk at all. Uh, that's nice. There's some nice features of that. Uh, and then they had Slither, because it translates to C, can leverage all the libraries of C, including OpenCL. Uh, so, 
Actually, if you combine Slither with, say, CLang, lib CLang to compile to LLVM, then you could do both Numba and Slither together. <laughs> so I, I see them as, you know, kind of two, you know, here's the space, they're here, they're both here, kind of two sides of the elephant. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice project. I know the author of Slither, actually, quite well. Okay, so is there any question else? Actually, yes, yes, that's one. Sorry, can I have one more question? <laughs> uh, I'm used the uh, Android to yeah. write some code, and uh, I love the uh, SL4A. And unfortunately, I cannot look at any module uh, NumPy support for, uh, for Android. Yeah, Android. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, do we have any schedule to, I mean, add your function in, in this small device? I. I use the front end, use the jQuery, and my back end. So, yeah, I, I would yeah. say it's on the roadmap, but it's on the roadmap because eventually your small device will be a window uh -huh. pushing code to servers where it's actually run. Yeah. And so on your small device, you'll be writing expressions. So sure, there'll be an interface that lets you write those expressions, but the code will execute on a, on a server. So I would say Blaze has more of a chance of supporting uh, Android uh -huh. than NumPy in the next five years. So <laughs> because the technology will be different. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of work. I mean, I don't even know what Python works on Android. I guess it uses the JVM, or is it uses Jython, or what is it doing? I'm not even sure. Anyway, cloud computing can yeah. change a lot of things. <laughs> and we thanks again to Dr. Oliphant for his great talk. Thank and you. if you have any further questions, please feel free, free to <laughs> take the question out, uh, offline and just go to Dr. Elephant. And thank you, we will have about 20 minutes of break and for the next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.